Good afternoon. Uh, now we'll move to the track number three, uh, ubiquitous education track, chaired by uh, Professor uh, Saleh al -Araji, Head of Communication Engineering Department at Khalifa University. Please uh, join me and welcome Dr. Uh, Saleh al -Araji. Please. Hello there. So welcome to track three. We have uh, two sessions under track three. The first section, uh, session uh, is invited speakers. So we have two invited speakers. And the second session we have uh, three paper presentations. So I welcome our first speaker. Mr. Abdul Wahid bin Dawa. Uh, Abdul Wahid carries 23 years experience in the software and telecommunication field and has held various management positions in leading corporations such as France uh, Telecom, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard and now at Google. Abdul Wahid is really passionate about working in emerging markets and now being at Google he is really relishing the opportunity in working with cutting edge this disruptive innovation. We are honored to welcome Mr. Abdul Wahid. His address is entitled Google Vision in Education and Smart Learning. So, start. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. You have 20 minutes. All right, I'll do that. I'm from the Mediterranean side, so 20 minutes for me is like a very short time. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Um, um, so when I was listening actually to all the presentations this morning, um, and uh, I mean the, yesterday and today, uh, I was actually wondering uh, what, is, what is else I can add to all the great things that have been said from, uh, from different presenters. So uh, before going into details and share with you what uh, Google is doing actually in, uh, in, uh, in, te in, in education, uh, and in technology in particular, I'd like to share with you uh, a bit of my own vision about technology itself. <clears throat> so for those who are my age, I think they will understand what I'm talking about. Um, for those who are a little bit younger, I can, I can share with you around the coffee, actually. So um, I remember when I was um, at university, uh, I was actually uh, using emails, and I was exchanging information with other universities, mainly in US and so on. Um, and that was for me like something very interesting because uh, I couldn't explain it to my parents, for example. So my parents would ask me, what are you doing? What are you learning? And so on. And that was very complex for them. So trying to explain them that I'm exchanging information real time with people who are like 12 hours behind us or 10 hours behind us um, uh, and getting, you know, like real time communication was something very strange. And then very interesting to see how the technology has evolved. And we reach a point uh, in time where things uh, have switched in a very interesting way. So you probably also remember the first mobile phone you got, probably black and white for those who remember. And then we got the colors one. There was eight colors actually, it was very precise. Um, um, and, and then we've seen the technology evolving so fast. So now it's, I mean, it's, it's part of our life. So we don't realize actually how much technology is in a piece of device that we have in, uh, in our hand. But something that was very interesting that happened is when I used to go work uh, in the 1990-something, uh, actually, I used to use very, very advanced technologies. All right? And suddenly, what happened is I started to use technologies for my personal use that are actually much more advanced than what I have in my work. And that was a switch which was very interesting. And that's actually also what happened from an education perspective. And if we try to summarize all the discussion that we had this morning, uh, and, and uh, there was a gentleman here, the guy who was talking about hummus, <laughs> uh, who was mentioning that, uh, or, or it, probably it was someone else, um, uh, we probably don't want to switch it completely uh, to the students. So we need to, to, to make sure that there is still uh, a role to play for the teacher. Okay? Or maybe it's some, somewhere in between. So there is, there, is, there is that place, that area that we need, uh, we need to find now. So at Google, when we look at technology, that's exactly the way we look at it as well. All right? And that when we look at what the technology can actually bring to the education space, we also look at it this way. 
So when Google started to, so Google comes from uh, consumer space, as you know. Uh, so at a point in time, like six, seven years back, um, Google started to think this technology that we are using on the consumer space, which is much more advanced than the technology that companies are using, why don't we bring that technology to the uh, enterprise business? Okay? And, and that was like disruptive. So people say, well, come on. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a business guy. I can't use this uh, Google, Gmail, Hotmail stuff. This is for children, you know? And I'm using the big exchange server and so on. Uh, and then you talk to a new child or it's someone that you just hired and he's telling you, oh, well, you know, on Hotmail, on Gmail, on Yahoo, I can do X, Y, Z, and so on. But you can't do that. And you are the business guy. So you are the guy who is supposed to have the, the most advanced technology. So that was a kind of disruption. Okay? So, so the, way, the way Google approach it is actually really think, try to think or take things from a different, uh, different angle, different perspective. All right? So when it comes to, um, uh, to business, we think about it the same way when it comes to education. So when we are talking about the switch happening, where actually the student with all the brackets at the right place becomes somehow more intelligent, which is not true than the teacher, of course, uh, there, is, there is a space actually where we need to, um, uh, to have that kind of open, uh, open discussion. Because at the same time, we don't want to block the students from learning the way they want to learn. Because at the end of the day, that's the simplicity we would like to bring to make sure that the children are actually ready uh, moving, to a, moving to a job. Okay? So let me take you uh, through um, uh, the way we look at it from, uh, from a Google perspective. So we look at it from three pillars. Access, device, and content. We think that when you, when you bring technology to the education space, the most important is to make that technology as transparent as possible. All right? If the technology becomes the main or the mean, then there is a problem somewhere. All right? So you want to make sure that this technology is actually here to help connect the student and the teacher, okay? not to become the main subject of discussion or the complexity. All right? So when you take a big university and they say, okay, we're going to implement uh, a way to make sure that all the students get connected. Uh, and when that project takes like two, three years, buying hardware, buying storage, implementing uh, complex software, uh, hiring uh, companies, engineers to, to, to connect the whole thing, um, by the time they finish, by the time they get that technology ready, the technology has already evolved. Okay, and that's the power actually that cloud computing is also bringing not only to businesses, but also bringing to the education space. And you've seen it. So we talk about speed, and I would like to talk about acceleration. When, when I got graduated, I could almost say, okay, if I, if I study in that kind of field, I'm going to have a good job, and I'm going I'm to make good money, and so on, and, and then I can evolve in my career, and so on. And that's not the case anymore for our children. Okay? So I might have to change job like probably four or five times the first year, uh, probably every two years, okay? And my, my father and my grandparents, they probably had two jobs in their life, all right? So we're not talking about uh, evolution or speed, we're really talking about acceleration. So by the time you implement a new technology, by the, by the time you actually teach it, by the time people understand how it works, it's already obsolete. And the students, I have three children, and I can tell you they learn very quickly they really learn definitely more quickly than we used to learn at that time. So they will adapt the technology in a, in, a, in, in, in a very natural way. So you just give them the basics, how to access it, and then you forget they will find everything by themselves. You don't need to teach them, okay? And actually, if you take the technology that are used in the consumer space, you will find that there is no user's guide for it. There is no user's guide for Gmail. There is no user's guide for Hotmail, nor for Yahoo, right? Because that's very natural kind of technology. So you just embrace the technology, and then you know how uh, you figure out uh, you figure you figure out yourself how to use it. And then the power is behind the capability and the capacity of the technology to evolve and you to adapt to it and to use the power of uh, of the different functionalities that are provided by the by the technology. So that's what we call the platform. So we have a platform called Google Apps that you probably heard about. Uh, uh, 
Uh, and it's basically bringing that consumer space, uh, knowledge, know-how, into the education space, the same way we bring it to the businesses. And then, the device. And you've, you've heard, I mean, the whole day, yesterday and today, uh, that students are not only learning uh, when they go to school, so they are learning the whole day, the whole time, okay? And on top of that, not only they are learning almost all the time, but they are also learning the way they want, and they are learning through the device. I mean, they are getting access to the technology with their own device, okay? If they like uh, a Samsung tablet, if they like uh, an iPad, that's actually their choice, okay? So what, what, what technology needs to make sure is that we don't oblige to use the technology in a certain way in order to actually reach an objective. So that's, that's what we call the device access. And then, of course, the content. And on the content, I'm not going to go deep. First, because, to be honest, I have really absolutely no knowledge on education, to be honest. Uh, so when it comes to content, when it comes to curriculum, uh, uh, I think our, uh, our governments, our policy makers are much more and much better positioned and of course all the universities are, and so on are much better positioned to actually deal with that uh, space. The most important is that we have the technology to be able to bring the content that we think is the right content for the students. Okay? And of course the ability to scale. So if we deploy a technology in a university and we say okay, we can only have 2,000 e-books because we don't have space to have more. Then what's the point? Okay? So if you take technologies, I mean, just to take one as an example, if you take technologies like YouTube, and just to give you an idea of, of, of the scale, there is 100 hours of videos uploaded to YouTube every minute. Just think about the space that it requires. Videos, HD videos, 100 hours every minute. That's what we call scale. Right. And also on the access, the way uh, we ensure that we help also universities from an access perspective. Um, uh, Google has a lot of bandwidth. So for example, if you know in Africa, we have um, uh, two big backbones that goes around Africa, uh, optical fibers. Uh, Google own a big part of it. Right? And we actually deliver that to, uh, uh, to countries to support the education space as well. Okay, so that's what we call the, the content. So the content, when it comes to content, we're not really actually providing the content. The content is provided either by universities, by governments, and so on. But we are here to bring the technology that supports the delivery of that content the fastest way and the right way to the end user with the right device, the device that the uh, student will choose on. So talking about culture, uh, so we always think that uh, once we get graduates and we go, we have a job. Uh, and the learning phase is behind us. Huh? And actually, the, the thing is, I mean, even at, uh, at Google, and I can share that with you, I mean, you know that. Uh, we keep learning all the time, uh, even at the first job. Uh, uh, and the surprise we get is when we get the first job, we realize that all the things we learned are actually not <laughs> really useful, uh, or actually are useful, but in a different way. Uh, so the, the way we think about it also at Google is, uh, and that's and that coming back to the, to the culture, uh, and you probably read that on, uh, on some of the pictures or videos of uh, some of the Google offices. Um, uh, we have a very open culture, and that's also part of the learning. So we want to make sure that uh, Google employees are actually learning the way they believe is the right way. Okay? So it's also by making them more responsible of the results. So we don't judge people of coming at the office at 8, leaving at 12 for lunch, coming at 2, and then leaving at 6, and so on. We just judge people by results the same way we would look at it from an education perspective. Did the children get the point that we want him to get? Okay? Not did he get what the teacher want him to get? Okay? Did he reach the objective? Whatever is the path he has been using, did he reach the objective? So when you go to a Google office, it's, uh, I come from a different company as before, but uh, when, when you start the first day, it's a bit disrupting. Uh, so you come and there is baby food, there is uh, a lot of things, you know, so why? that's a really cool environment actually. Uh, there is a lot of pressure of course, uh, and a lot of stress as well. Um, uh, but the environment is set in a way that you, you decide basically, uh, you take the responsibilities on how you achieve that result. And that's also uh, part of our, uh, of our culture. So the question is, uh, what, is uh, what is the complexity? And that's the complexity, okay? 
So we, uh, I'm talking as a parent now, uh, we have to prepare our children for something that we actually don't really know. So I don't know what's, what's going to be the best job in 10 years. I, can't, I, I really can't answer that question. And I don't think any of us can answer that question. Okay? I don't know what, it, what is the field that will be the best uh, when, when, when my children will, uh, will graduate. I, I just have no idea, to be honest. Okay? So if you would have asked me the question, so if you would have asked the question to my parents, he would, they would have probably give you a good idea of which direction to take. Okay? So they told me that engineering is good, so I was passionate by physics, so I've done physics. Uh, and then I joined a company that doesn't do physics at all, <laughs> but I still enjoy it. Okay? So the learning that I got is, is the way I do things, the way I think, and so on. So it's not really about the content that I learned at school. It's about the way people are thinking, the way they are uh, reaching objectives, and so on. So that's, that's also the way we look at it. So coming back to, um, uh, to that complexity, and again, we look at it from access, collaboration, uh, information, and scale. So real-time access to online education resources. So I as I was sharing before, making sure that whatever is the device you are using can be a device, a mobile one, can be a PC like this one, uh, or a Chromebook for, some, for, for those of you who heard about it. Um, uh, it doesn't matter from where we are accessing the information. The same way we do it in the enterprise. You go to the office, you have your big screen, and you access the information. And then you are on the way to airport. And the only device I have when I'm going to the airport, I mean, the one that is easy to access is my mobile device. But I still want to make sure that I can do things while I'm on my way to airport, for example. So that's what we call the access. And then the platform itself, I'm not going to spend that, I'm not going to spend time on this one, but that's, that's basically what I was sharing with you. And finally, how to share the information. So we, we believe that collaboration, and that's actually true, and that's why I'm, I'm, I keep trying to make this uh, link between uh, working environment and the education environment. The same way we, at, in, in, in the uh, business space, we want to make sure that people are collaborating real time. Okay? And when I say collaborating real time, it's not about someone writing a document, sending it to 20 people, saying, okay, give me your feedback, and so on. And then you receive 20 feedbacks. You have no idea which one to take. Some of them might be contra contrarying each other, and so on. So you want, to, re you want to, to be online with everyone at the same time and collaborating and building something together. Okay? And that's what we call group uh, productivity. YouTube, I don't think I need to go a bit more, but that's basically what I was saying. So if you go to YouTube, there is 700,000 videos, okay, just dedicated to education. If you think about a university having to host actually 700,000 videos, that's a lot. Many universities have already adopted that technology, okay, and of course they adopt, they use the technology, and the interesting thing is very often I'm asked, but how, how are they doing it? And I said, listen, I'm not going to answer that question because you have to figure out how you're going to use that technology for the way you want to teach or to transfer the knowledge. All right? And finally, and I will conclude with that, and then we can take some questions. Um, as I said, and you remember I said, we want also to make sure, and that's a step further, that that technology which we are bringing to students, teachers, and to parents, Sometimes we forget the parents. We need to make sure that technology is transparent. Right? So we want to make sure that when the student is using that technology, he's not actually spending his time trying to figure out how to make the technology work, but using the technology to learn what he has to learn. Right? So some years ago, we, had, uh, we launched Chromebook. Uh, and it's a very interesting concept. Uh, and if I'm OK on time, I will just share with you the way, uh, the way we're looking at it. Uh, yeah? So, any, any of you remember the uh, sun, sun ray? Come on. Yes. So you are the only one above 40 then. <laughs> yes, two. So sun ray was a very interesting uh, technology coming from Sun Microsystem, uh, which has been bought by Oracle later. Uh, they had that device that you plug actually in, uh, in, in, in an office. And you have your ID card, so you plug the ID card in the device, you work, you do your emails, document, whatever. You, you just get the card up, you know, you are, I don't know, you are in New York, you fly to Paris, you take the same device, you have that in the office, you plug the card again, and you have exactly the same environment you had when you left New York. But that was 15, 20 years ago. 
Okay? So the concept is coming back. All right? So the concept didn't really work at that time because there was no internet and there wasn't the power of internet we have today. So the technology, this technology is coming back and that's actually the way Chromebook is working. So what is Chromebook? Chromebook is, uh, has been launched with one thing in mind. When people are starting on a computer, the first thing they do, they launch a browser. And then they do everything on a browser, especially your children. Okay? Everything they do is on a browser. Video conference, email, document, write documents, save documents. Everything they do is in a browser. The first thing they do is they launch a browser. So we said, okay, why, why do we have all these things in a computer then? So let's remove everything, and when you start a computer, you have a browser. So the only thing you have is a browser. Okay? So we launched Chromebook, and uh, it's a bit disrupting because people say, oh, what, is, what do I save my files? You don't save your files. All your files are in the cloud. So you access them from anywhere, at any time, in, from any device. So, all right? so for example, the university, I mean, the government of um, Malaysia, when the government was reviewing their strategy for education, they decided to actually enable all the schools and universities with Chromebooks. So they, they acquired actually 10, Chrome, 10, 10 million Chromebooks from, uh, from Samsung. Uh, and they built their entire strategy based, uh, based on that approach. And why? Because they want to make sure that when they give a PC to a student, he's not stuck with antivirus, anti-spam, and all these things that you know are extremely complex, lack of space, etc., etc. So they just want to make sure that they access the technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abdul Wahid, for this uh, interesting lecture. One question. <laughs> Time for one question. Let me scan. OK. Please, look, make it short. <laughs> yeah, I apologize for asking many questions. But in the end of the day, we need to interact. And in the end of the day, this is for the interest of our society and the world, uh, I suppose. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that Google does not consider uh, the matter of the cross-culture differences. I have proof. I wouldn't like to embarrass anyone, but now if we go, for example, well, maybe this is out of subject, but I have to tackle since you are representing uh, Google somehow. Uh, when we take, we as unit of knowledge, we as adult, or whatever you call it, uh, you would like to use, uh, uh, for example, navigation. As soon as I come to the heart of Abu Dhabi, where the Arabian Gulf is there, a street, it says Persian Gulf Street. <laughs> that kills us. Now, it is not, I'm not politician. I'm son of politicians. <laughs> Therefore, I need to say this. Now, when you want to tackle it with somebody who may change it, who may, let us say, do something about it, we cannot get anyone, but just they send program, software, whatever, every day. Therefore, cross-cultural differences not being taken into consideration as far as we are concerned and how we look at the Google. Um, well, that's a very interesting subject. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to answer without entering into politics. So just for information, I'm born in Morocco. I'm Moroccan. Um, uh, and we have the same, same issues. So there is a part of Morocco that, of course, Moroccans consider it as Morocco. Uh, but the United Nations says, well, it's, uh, uh, it's an area that is uh, under dispute, basically. So, so they put a line that between bracket piece of all the Moroccans, all right? Uh, but at a, point in the, at a point in time, you also want to be neutral. So what we do is we use actually the definition, which is the one coming from the United Nations. So when we look at cross-cultural, and, and I agree, and there is no answer, and I, I, I'll be the first one actually to be disappointed because I'm from this area, so from the Arabic world, and I want to, uh, to also push in that direction. So we, I mean, internally at Google, the people from that region is also pushing to, to make, and, and you've seen some changes recently on, uh, on the local map as well. So that's... Add two days for you. <laughs> when they sell it in California, they don't mind to fix it or mix it with and that's and that's our role. Yeah. <laughs> so Google in UAE was six or seven people when I joined a few years back. We are about sixty people. Uh, so there is uh, like 50, 50 more people actually pushing that direction. To be honest. Uh, 
uh, and that's that's our role. So that's the work we're trying to do. And there, is, there have been a lot of changes. I mean, just on the languages, for example. Um, so we used to have pure Arabic. Uh, now we have also the different cultures from the different countries. So you even have Moroccans, you know. So some people consider it not Arabic, but uh, <laughs> that's another discussion. But we have uh, we have also the flavors of different uh, the different Arabics we have. We also included, you know, like for South Africa. Uh, for Iraq, Swahili, uh, Kurdi, this kind of thing. So that's, I know, I know, I'm not trying to convince. I'm not trying to convince. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is, there is work in progress, and hopefully things will happen. Okay. <laughs> Can we take this outside, please? Thank you. Thank you very much.